<laughs> the button's not working, Janice. Okay. Uh, I'll call you on lock. It is not <laughs> I know, I don't care. I, Homan taught me that. I am here to entertain myself. <laughs> I don't care if you think it's funny or not. I, if I enjoy it, it's okay. You taught me a lot of other really cool things, too. Um, welcome to our program for today. And again, I will make you a, a handmade something fantastic if you can come up with a better uh, title than one small thing because it gets awkward. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, if you're a professional, you don't have to worry about that. So, uh, today we have three panelists. We have Jason Burston from uh, philosophy. We have Danielle from history and Robin from English. And they're just going to talk about one thing that they've done in their classroom that's that's been successful. Come on in. Oh, the it's in the cat area. Like yeah. It. yeah. Um, so this has been successful in the past. We've had I've learned a lot, and so I'm excited to learn today. And because my colleague Jason is not feeling really well, I'm going to let you go first, and you can talk about your um, activity. Okay, you bet. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Good to see you. <clears throat> um, yeah. So the thing that I um, that I tried is called Three Stay One Stray. And I came across it on a um, a website called Teach Philosophy 101, and it just gives a lot of resources uh, and ideas for philosophy uh, pedagogy. And um, the basic idea is that you have people get into groups, and then you know how often we'll just have them, you know, we'll give them a problem to solve, and then they'll talk about it in their each group, and then we might ask each group to kind of report out, you know, the results at the end. Uh, but that can kind of take a long time. And so the idea here is to um, have like groups of four. And then, you know, you give them a problem to solve. In my case, I gave them, um, in my help ethics class, I gave them a case study. And they were had to identify relevant moral principles uh, or values, you know, that are important for thinking through this kind of case. And then um, look for conflicts between those different principles, uh, as there almost always will be. And then kind of work through uh, weighing and balancing those principles. So, for example, um, one principle might be the principle of autonomy, which says that you should basically let people make their own decisions and respect their, their dignity as rational beings. And that might get into conflict with the principle of beneficence, which says that you should help others because there might be some kind of case where by infringing on someone's autonomy, you might actually benefit them. All right. So that's called paternalism. So it, it, when is that when is, is that justified? That just that kind of thing. So um, and then what happens is after a certain amount of time, one person from each group goes over to another group and briefs them on what their group came up with, right? So instead of having the groups work separately and then reporting back to the whole class, um, you, you kind of get everyone involved, you kind of build some social skills. And when, when I did it, I, I screwed up. I, um, I told them to pick the person who is gonna be the reporter, the strayer uh, early, I like at the beginning because my thought, well, I guess that was probably just often just um, just habit. I often, you know, have them pick that person first. So there's no big surprises. But I realized that you should probably not do that so that everyone um, knows that they might be required to uh, summarize and disseminate the ideas that came up in their group. So I, I wish I had done that a little differently. Um, 
but it was pretty successful. I mean, it got people talking, got people going around the room, introducing themselves and kind of working together. And it, it kind of forced the, the people in the group, it kind of gave them an added responsibility, right? So they're not just going to like come report to the class and then go on to the next person. They're going to have to really try to understand it well enough to describe it, to kind of teach it to somebody else, right? To the other group. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> one problem that came up though was uh, I still wanted them all to report back at the end, right? Because I didn't, I couldn't really tell the quality of the of the, the the dissemination, right? I couldn't really tell the quality of like the person reporting what their group had come up with. So I was kind of floating around trying to figure that out. But as I was doing that, I could tell that kind of changed the dynamic a little bit, right? They were almost kind of talking to me and not to the group. So I think I'm going to try it again because I like the idea of, of, um, you know, building those kinds of skills. Um, but next time I do it, I'm not going to tell them ahead of time who's going to be the, the the wandering reporter. And I need to think more about how to assess or monitor the quality of the of the um, the the reporting. Um, but they seem to enjoy it. It got them moving around. It was something a little different. I did it. One cool thing about it was I did it early in the semester. So it helped build a kind of camaraderie, you know, build a sense of uh, togetherness with the group. So, yeah, that's that's what I did. Um, I've got uh, some if you just Google, you can just Google this yourself. But if you Google three stay, one stray, you'll see I found there's actually a lot of folks who talk about this idea under the rubric of uh, cooperative learning. Uh, so yeah, that's my story. I'm raising my hand. Okay. Jason, thank you for doing this even though you don't feel good. I hope you feel better soon. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm doing some recovery at home too, so I'm feeling you. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting because I, I was thinking about it being under collaborative learning. I wonder how much does the, use or quality, of course, it needs to be some quality, but I wonder if how much of the assessment of quality really matters when the, if the objectives really to get them to put it in their own words, communicate it to somebody else. Like, I wonder if you could clean up some of those facts or reasoning or, you know, whatever is going to be assessed on, on exams or assessments a, a different way and just kind of like let a little bit of that quality, I keep in that in quotes, uh, go because the objective so different. And I imagine that you know, unless there's false stuff, right? Unless there's wrong. Did, did yeah. you find any incidences of that really though? Or did they correct each other? They they pretty much corrected each other. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a couple misunderstandings that were kind of like uh, throughout the room <laughs> about a couple things, but I was able to clear those up. But yeah, for the most part, they, were, um, they weren't they were saying anything factually incorrect or anything. Robin has a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you could build that fact checking in by having like when you come to big class reporting time, if you have the other group explain what the strayer told them and then then have the other or, and then give the original group an, an opportunity to say, oh, wait, they got that wrong or there was something lost in translation. Yeah, yeah. Or that's not quite what we meant. Right. Uh, or something simply as uh, what did your group learn from yeah. the strayer? Yeah. You know, what what did they have different? Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Um, I was also thinking maybe like after doing all that, um, you know, having the three stay one stray thing, then maybe just going into a, a class discussion as a whole without any more reporting. And that way we've got a lot of... Uh, you know, they've already been talking to each other. They've been thinking about it. They got the other group to think about. So, um, you know, the discussion could be what's something that surprised you about the other group or what's something that just have, have a general conversation about, say, the case study in this case. Um, that way I can maybe make sure they're at least on the right track. Um, and then in that way, also the other people like Robin, to, to your point, other people, people in the original group can clarify possible misunderstandings. So, 
yeah, thanks for that. And I, and I also, you know, the, the reason Jason suggested this is that we're, uh, we have a class where only, well, about five people dominate the discussion. And so we enjoy that, but we don't want it to happen every time. And so, but this way, you could call on people because they, they're not, uh, you know, they, they did talk about it in their group. And so that would be a good way to include more people as well, right? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, that's a good idea too. That's a good idea too. And what? I think one of the, you hit one of the best benefits of it is it's just going to get people used to talking in your class, you know, so doing it early. I think as I'm thinking about that, a nice thing to do it early is also have an early, early one be one where there are no right or wrong facts, like like opinion, you know, just kind of more yeah. example or opinion yeah. based so that then you don't have to worry about it at all. And just showing we are going to be talking to each other in here because I bet, Jason, what you just said would be right on. If you did that and then open up to the big class discussion, it's going to make the big class discussion deeper, more meaningful, quicker, you know, deeper, more meaningful. Quicker. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, as you say, the objective is so much, uh, is the, the the social element is such a big part of the objective that, um, yeah, I definitely want to emphasize that and not emphasize them getting everything exactly right in that, because that's not the point of it, right? That's that's the point of it is to get them th talking and thinking and then, you know, feeling comfortable uh, sharing the ideas, yeah. All right. Yeah. I think we can move on. Uh, I believe it would be good. I, I'm not a great timekeeper, but thank you so much for that, Jason. I hope you feel better. Man. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, Danielle, if you'd like to share. Forgive the papers. I am not great at extemporaneous speaking, so this is how I stay on time. <laughs> so, my one little thing, it works for me, um, it was the yellow page. And this is an activity that I've done to my students before introducing assignment instructions. This was actually born out of a failed online annotation exercise. Um, this activity helps channel our students' fears or frustrations about assignments productively, and it ensures that they can engage with the directions when we do finally distribute and accept them. So my Problem. The, this is the problem that this little thing is designed to allay. It's the problem of the what I call the panic popcorn because I teach a lot of introductory level courses um, with non majors. So here's the problem: when I mention tasks or quizzes, presentations related to my history courses, the energy shifts in very unsettling ways, and I think we've all seen this for students engage in that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response um, as panic settles across the classroom. So you see students disappearing into their phones or the panicked questions start screaming across the room. And then there's a sense of uh, disarray as that panic spreads. So I found that it was um, very common in the intro level classes and whether it manifests as this disturbing quiet or as this frenzy of questions. Um, it undermined, I found, a meaningful engagement with the assignment instructions because you would pass out the instructions and the students are like, no, I'm not or they're not I don't have any questions. So they couldn't engage with the directions no matter how well organized or phrased they were in my 1,000 level classes. So here's how the Yellow Pages works to fix that. Um, first of all, why is it called the Yellow Pages? It was the color of the note cards in my desk the day that I like panically put this together after my initial exercise of having students annotate the instructions failed. So uh, here are the steps. I pass out a bunch of blank pages or note cards to the students at the start of class. I just mentioned the name of the assignment, test one guys. And then I have students write down their assignment fears, their concerns, their questions, their preferences for the assessment. Um, from there, so they fill up the little sheet with all their fears. From there, I bring them into a small uh, think, pair, share, where they share those common fears, concerns, frustrations, 
and preferences. Then I hand out the instructions and encourage the students to actually use the yellow sheets to find the answers before we finally report out and have a large group discussion based on their yellow cards plus the instructions. So that's my one little thing. So feedback, observationally, you're gonna get pushback. You're gonna get pushback generally in a 1,000 level class mm -hmm. um, for a multitude of reasons, but my students were initially annoyed at this additional step to shut up, give us the assignment directions so that we can fold them up and put them in our app. Um, so the atmosphere, however, I noticed was calmer throughout the process because we were modeling healthier and more productive practices for dealing with the uncomfortable emotions of getting an assignment in a class that you're uncomfortable with to do something you don't want to do on a topic that you're not initially excited about. Um, and here's, oh, yeah, incomplete feedback. The other thing, I uh, noticed that in my evals, my evals are slightly higher for communication and clarity of goals and com uh, communication of expectations and needs from students. So overall, my students feel as though they're getting more out of the instructions and that I'm doing a better job to describe assignments to them. And they also feel more engaged because as the semester goes on, they can make suggestions that I'll take into consideration. So, hey, Doc, does it need to be all of these questions or can it just be half? And actually listening and engaging with student questions um, and suggestions on how to improve this. So, three quick tips because I already failed the semester implementing this. No? Use physical note cards over just the thing pair share. Um, there is a power of physically manifesting those feelings on a sheet of paper and then use seeing questions that are not ans answerable from those fears and frustrations. And then in line with CAT FD's larger principles of backwards design, um, you can also and should also use this as a way for affirming your course outcomes. Um, so as you're going through and students are asking questions, why are we doing it this way? Why does it have to be this number of pages? Why this number of words? You can use it as an opportunity to say, oh, course outcome number four, we're focusing on primary sources for this reason and that reason. Um, and then finally, um, I use, a tip is to also use this activity to highlight the logic of your instructions. Because in each and every one of our classes, we have our own logic for putting together our directions and students quickly get overwhelmed by them. Um, so using it as an opportunity to say, this is why I'm thinking about doing A, B, and C, um, and encouraging them to say, hey, this is organized into purpose, task, and assessment. How about you use that organization to find your answers faster rather than slower? So overall, it has been successful. I continue to tweak, like to change it up and make small modifications, but um, it has been relatively successful. Um, and just a general sense of students feeling one more empowered by the end of the semester. Two, I don't get those. Last minute questions. Y'all know those last minute questions. Email to you at 959 when the assignments do at 1001. You know, teach. So it helps with that. And then by the end of the semester, students feel far more comfortable um, asking questions of me, the material, and the assessments themselves, and how to connect back to the learner. So those are my points. If y'all have any questions. Um, I, I think Try what, I, <laughs> what I uh, get from um, your presentation is, and I think it's that students will get it, is that you care about them and their anxiety and you want them to be able to share that. And starting off the semester that way is is really good. It's really, I, I, I'm going to do that. Uh, it sounds good. Thank you. 
Um, it does actually try to validate their feelings by reminding them that history is cheese covered broccoli. So we all have to eat it. We can sprinkle a little cheese on it, help it go down a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, if there's too much broccoli, no one is going to eat it. And if there's too much cheese, um, what's the point of it? It mm -hmm. kind of just loses its out. So I kind of validate your feelings, remind them that it's difficult to together to eat. I like that you, if I can say something to you, I like that you that you're doing this in a really methodical way and that you're connecting it to the course goals, et cetera. Because um, I, I often, well, I shouldn't say often, I sometimes will hand out um, index cards to students and just have them write down whatever questions they have because the, there is that, that, that moment, that frozen moment when I ask the students, okay, what questions do you have? No one has a single question. And so then I rephrase the question. Okay, do I need to clarify this? Or is there anything I need to repeat? Um, if you look at your notes for the very few students who take notes, uh, apparently, you know, is there anything incomplete that I can finish? Silence. So then I hand out the cards and then the cards come back with questions. So. There is that factor of, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to sound stupid. Um, and I, 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 of all of my classes, at least this semester, I only really have one where students are really verbally engaged. And all the other ones, they're happy to write things down, but they don't really want to talk very much. And so I, I appreciate that you're doing this in a, in a much more methodical way than I, than I am. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Wendy, can I, can I uh, share something that's kind of along those lines? When I've gotten that with the students, and again, I tried to do it early on for exactly back to Jason's about trying to get them used to being really chatty earlier. I want that kind of, you know, interactive class. Um, when I get no questions, I do a think pair share right then. And I just say, okay, every, turn to your partner, turn to people around you, groups two, three, and everybody come up with you know, try to come up with a question and man yeah. all of a sudden when they validate each other's questions then they you know they it's a flood of questions like you're with your cards so i haven't done that with cards but i've done that with think pair share a lot so yes so danielle thank you robin uh, oh i was gonna say i think this is a really great idea especially for um larger long term ass uh, assignments like i'm thinking about research papers um and you know there are lots of fears obviously but then this is the one thing that i was thinking about is could you also build in or would this undermine it like a a personal responsibility angle like part of this is you showing them that you thought about most of the questions um mm -hmm. that they have and, and they can find the answers in the documents so part of it but um yeah, I'm just trying to think about like, because sometimes their fears are less about the assignment than about their ability to get it done. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just wondering about how how to build that element. And, but no, I think this is perfect for, um, yes, your, your, your questions, your, your fears can be addressed and you can address them. That's great. <clears throat> All right, Robin. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is just a, it's a, a thing that I do uh, to encourage students to talk, to share their uh, knowledge, but also lack thereof, to be comfortable um, asking questions and not knowing things, and also to be comfortable uh, finding answers themselves. Um, and then we can start talking about where do we find that information, how good it is. It's very language specific. So um, this is um, a short piece that I teach in my English composition and rhetoric classes. We begin the semester evaluating other people's writing, right? Thinking about what choices did they make as writers um, and were those choices first place? Uh, this is Gloria and Zoldua's How to Tame a Wild Tongue from her book called Borderlands. Um, it's all about how she felt um, 
robbed of her speech growing up in um, the American Southwest. Um, so it, it's very straightforward, but this piece comes with a lot of um, personal anecdotes. So she talks about growing up in school and not being able to read Chicano literature or uh, not being able to speak Spanish in class, you know, all of these um, maybe familiar um, experiences about your particular language brand being squashed and rejected from formal academic settings, right? Or elite settings. Anyway, so um, last time I taught this, I said, because I'm an English teacher, I care about specific words. I said, I know that this is the part that gets me is this, this opening anecdote. So this is where she says, we're going to have to control your tongue, the dentist says, pulling out all the metal from my mouth. Silver bits plop and tinkle into the basin. My mouth is a mother load. So I start going all crazy with my English you know, major self by saying, all right, let's think about what this means. Who likes going to the dentist? Weirdly, a lot of my students do. I don't. So, but I'm thinking you're you're laying down under a strange person, and they're inside you with tools, right? How vulnerable are you, right? And then we get to the question to the word. My mouth is mother load, and so I ask my students, "What does mother load mean?" Anybody? Okay, where do we think we or around in what kinds of contexts? Can we imagine having heard the word mother load? Lying. Yes, perfect. Does anyone want to Google it? Anyone want to Google mother load? So it takes a minute. Mother load is like the the the, the mind that's got all the stuff. It's like the mother load, like this is what we've been waiting for. It's everything. Isn't that treasure? Yeah. It's right. the treasure. And then you want to read the first sentence she comes up? The principal vein or an or or mineral. So then we get to why this word is so important for Gloria and Luna's argument, because yes, right, her mother tongue, the earth is the source of this valuable material, but also um, if we go to the larger context for this, the, the American Southwest, right, we get to talk about manifest destiny. Right. And how um, the uh, English speaking Americans who are trying to rip that valuable source of her identity out of her mouth. Right. Out of her culture, out of her land. Anyway, and we get all this by just Googling one word. Um, yeah. So it doesn't always work out this, this beautifully <laughs> that the first definition is perfect. Um, but if we get diff different definitions, then we can talk about how or why one is better than the other. Yeah, um, I mentioned value. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So whenever uh, we come across a word that the students don't know, rather than me telling them, we just pause and look it up. So, and that way also I can call on students who aren't maybe as vocal um, and or I can encourage someone who is already on their device to use it for good. So yeah, that's it. So Googling an un the unfamiliar term. Yeah, and then talking about who, and then whoever gets to it first, mm -hmm. and then reading the definition aloud, mm -hmm. talking about how it works, what, it, what meaning it makes or adds to a passage, and then seeing if someone else has a different definition uh, that might help further. That's it. You know, I, when one reason, Sorry, why, one reason why I think this is so valuable, very, very simple, direct and valuable, is because I wonder how often our students are just reading, if they are reading, so many of our students just don't read, but if they're reading and passing over words that they don't know the definition of, and they just keep reading and keep reading, and they don't look up the words that they don't know, and I even tell my students, like, I still look up words if I'm reading a text and I don't know what it means. I still look it up, write it down in my notes or in my in my um, margins. You know, even at, at my age, quote unquote, no. I still look up words, but I don't think that they are looking up words. No, I think it's super basic and yes. it's super um, obvious, but I think it's good to model that activity. Mm -hmm. And if I could build on that, there was such a thrill for me because I have a lot of 
anxiety speaking in front of other people. I do. The moment, I just like the moment you asked me what a mother was. Like, yeah. I have no intention of speaking. But telling me to pull out my computer and Google it and I could read somebody else's words so I don't have to do the emotional load mm -hmm. of thinking of it myself. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of students, right, they, they want to feel engaged, but there there's anxiety there. And so they, this is how they can show it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our oh, in a similar way, I think there's a lot of value to uh, Googling terms that they know. Um, a student, first time in the semester, when they use the word tribe, talking about an African tribe, they say, hey, you know, that's a common word. Why don't you Google that and then click on images? Yes. What do you see? Oh, <laughs> I see a lot of savages and barbaric and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think there's value to both being familiar and not familiar with the word yeah. to Google it. Well, we had a uh, problem in uh, Catherine Laborda in our uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor class because it's written in the 50s and she, and so there are a lot of words that they don't know. And so Catherine um, would look through every article and then give them a quiz when they came into class about those particular words. And this, but, and, but this is a, such a better way to say, you can, you can talk to space with your phone. It just takes a second. Also, and I, it makes yeah. it, it means that a I'm not worried that you don't know it. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to be ashamed. Right. You just find out. And, yeah. and also, I don't have to tell you. Like right. this is we are learning together. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that a lot better. I, I like that. Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was talking over somebody. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I just I was gonna say yeah I I um. I'm agreeing. I've been nodding. Like, yes, I agree with everything. It's it's modeling it, just showing that they could do it. Like, even if they're pleasure reading, because a lot of our students do pleasure read, and that you can still, even then, when you hit a word or a context you don't know, look it up. So I like the modeling. I also like that um, all three of these um, small little things that happen in class that make a difference really are focused on engagement, even though there's a real ac good academic component to, to it as well. They're also engagement, which is kind of I think interesting. And then one thing I was going to say when I thought about this, because I, I do, I, I love that, Robin, I do, I like get out your phone and like, you know, we do this thing where we, in uh, Food Matters, where they have to bring in their favorite snack that comes in a bag and then like look up on your phone one of these ingredients that you don't know what it is. Like, why is it there and what else is it in? Because it's often in your Cheetos and in your mascara, right? So that's kind of a fun little thing. Um, but I was also going to say that uh, for those of you who might be interested in like infusing AI literacy into your courses, a cool activity could be like, okay, yeah, look up mother load on, you know, Google it, Google it, and let's share, and let's talk about it in the context of this. And now look it up on ChatGPT. What does ChatGPT say mother load is? How well did it do? Where did it fall short? Why is it shallow? Is a way to also kind of modeling you know, kind of AI literacy, which I think we're going to need to be start moving to as well. That's all. So it's like four things all at once. Blech. That's great. Uh, and what's so funny is it's marketed as little things. But these things to me are pretty huge. These are some really cool things. Uh, I'm just, I wish we had a fourth panelist, so because I already knew Jason. So but otherwise, it's really, <laughs> it's really good. And thank you for sharing because it's um yeah. Thanks for the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, right. I said you didn't get pizza. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming, everybody. And Helene, thanks for joining us online. I hope you got if you had questions, I'm sure you would have put them in the chat, but I hope you got what you needed out of this. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for doing this, y'all. There will be others, is that right? Other Yeah, there's a, uh, in a couple of weeks, there is a STEM version, and we can all learn from each other, so feel free to come to the STEM version.